Isn't it great to be together this morning? Yes. Hey, we had a, you can go ahead and clap if you want to. I mean, I live for Sundays. This is my favorite day of the week. It's sometimes my hardest day of the week, but it's my favorite day of the week, and you're the reason why. I love being with you. I love seeing you in person here. I love checking in on the, on the live streams that we've got going on right now and being able to chat and see people's names as they're checking in, and I don't know who the other ones are, but those who checked in, it was great to see your names this morning. It's just fun to be here. In fact, during the break, right after um, rehearsal this morning, all the band was kind of relaxing. So everyone went to Bible study. A couple of the guys came back into the office, and we were visiting together. And, uh, and Oscar, who's on our drums, said, this church is lit. <laughs> I'll let Oscar define that for you, but what he said is this is a very awesome place to be. And I don't, I don't know, Mateos, they're probably backstage coming, about to come back in for the message. Um, but Mateos, our electric guitar player, man, Essay, that was some serious play in this morning. <laughs> Wasn't that good? It's just fun to be together. And besides that, Josh said the next 20 minutes are going to be awesome. <laughs> I love Josh's optimism. Something can go wrong and Josh will look me straight in the face and he'll say, next time will be great. <laughs> I love that. And so prepare. You've got 18 minutes and 20 seconds of awesome coming up. We're in Second John and we're looking at this little tiny letter that John wrote, I believe, to a church. Some think it's to a lady who's hosting a church in her home. Either way, the truths are applicable. And we get to right to the middle of this letter, and so far it's all been relational. It's been about loving one another. It's been about working in a way that uh, in our relationships that they last and they're meaningful and they, they have a, a real sense of purpose to them. And then right in the middle of verse 7, there's only one chapter, so some people would say 2 John 1, others just say 2 John verse 7. Right in the middle of verse 7, John shifts gears, and, um, and it can appear, and it can sound kind of negative when you begin to read it. In verse 7, he says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. He's dealing with a very popular and developing heresy, false teaching in the first century A.D. that becomes fully engaged in the second century A.D. where they taught that Jesus could not have been physically born a human and be the Son of God simultaneously because they believed that those things that were spirit were inherently good, inherently holy, and so there was no way Jesus could be physical in the flesh and also be the Son of God in spirit. Now we know the scripture is very clear that Jesus was both God and man simultaneously. And that's what, John, that's what John is addressing and taking place here. He says this deceiver, again in verse 7, this deceiver and the, this, these are the deceivers and the antichrist, which is just a reference not to the character, the individual we find in the book of Revelation, but to anyone who contradicts the truth of God's word. Watch yourselves that you don't lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this is the one that has the, this one has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home and do not greet him. For the one who greets him shares in his evil works. Wow, it's kind of like what happened to that sweet old guy that was talking about how much we should love one another, how much we should care for one another, how we implement grace and mercy and truth and love into our relationships. And then suddenly it's like, whoa, there's all these things to be worried about. There's all these things to be concerned with. There's all these things to be cautious as we move forward. And the truth is, I believe that what's going on as John's writing this little letter is a recognition that the people we love the most the people we care about the most, we want to protect the most. I mean, we're all that way. If you've had children, you understand that because there probably is no one in your life you're more protective of than your kids. 
You fall in love, you get married, you're protective of your spouse. You, you have a deep and a great relationship with somebody, maybe a brother or a sister, a close friend, you want to protect them. But it can be a little frustrating sometimes because in order to protect, sometimes you have to acknowledge there's harm. There's things that we need to be cautionary about. There are things that we need to be careful and we need to avoid it and we need to be aware that these are pitfalls, potential dangers in our life. We know this because we live this way in our society. We have signs all the time that warn us. We have caution signs. We have warning signs. We have signs that tell us to stop, signs that tell us to, to yield. And that's essentially what John's giving is four signs that say, these are things you should be aware of. Now, my favorite cautionary sign I've seen it at a couple of our state parks in West Texas, seen it a, a couple of times online. But my favorite one is a picture of a rattlesnake. And it says, watch for rattlesnakes. And then there's a, almost a paragraph of information. Rattlesnakes are abundant in this area. Rattlesnakes are by nature venomous. Rattlesnakes should be avoided at all costs. Most snake bites in the states of Texas, and this is statistically true, happen not by accident, but when somebody's tormenting a rattlesnake. Leave the rattlesnake alone. Now, I'm going to be honest, as an outdoor guy, I'm thinking some things are self-evident. But you'll see it in different parks and different places. Of course, in our region on the, on, the, on the southeast coast of Texas, you can go to like the Brazos Bend State Park, just about 50 miles south of here, 60 miles south of here, uh, and then you have not only the ones that warn you about snakes, you have the ones that warn you about alligators. <laughs> Beware of the alligators. I never forget I was duck hunting one time on the coast. And um, I was actually hunting with a guy that ran the wildlife management area. One of the guys, he was working his way up. He was in school to become a, um, a game warden. And we were out on the coast. And uh, I had stepped in, it was real deep, dark, and murky water. And I stepped on what I thought was a log. And so I was going to step onto it to get a little more elevation. And as I did that, the log started to move. I said, this is so weird. The log's moving. And he says, it's an alligator. I said, what do you mean it's an alligator? He says, they're all over the place down here. It's just that during the winter months, they hibernate. They go into a semi-hibernation. They just kind of lay on the bottom and sleep. I'm a desert boy. I grew up in the desert. I understand rattlesnakes. I didn't understand alligators, but I understood what it means to walk on water at that moment and get away. <laughs> it just makes sense. If something's dangerous, avoid it. So here are the four signs that I think John is warning his close friends, the people he deeply loves. The first one, we've seen this on the Gulf Coast in places. If you ever been to Hawaii, this is the first time I ever saw it. It was in Hawaii because the strong rip currents are out there and you're surfing or waterboarding. You can get caught up in that. It's simply strong currents. Verse 7 says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. This is a familiar and regular problem, John says. They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Right there, they invalidate any belief in who Jesus really is. So in this moment, John's recognizing these people are not believers. He did that in 1 John. He told us flat out, people that go this far away from the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus and who Jesus is, when they're this far away, they never were a part of us in the first place. These deceivers have gone out into the world. They do not confess that Jesus is who Jesus claims to be. And these are, they are the deceivers and they are the ones who are opposed to Christ. Be aware, strong currents exist. And if that was true in the first century, it's true in the 21st century. And I know I say that a lot, but we always, anytime we study the Bible, we need to make that jump. We need to understand what's happening in the date and time and history of the context where God inspired the scripture, but we need to understand how that affects us today. We live in a world that is rampant with false teaching, and I'm not going to try to go through and give you a litany of it. Not everything you see on YouTube that tells you somebody is a false teacher is actually true. Some of it might be. But the bottom line is, John says, understand it's out there. Understand the dangers there. Be aware of it. And just simply be cautious. 
You, you can do a lot of things. You can study. You can, you can find there's multiple books. There's multiple websites that will help you understand what cults are, what false teaching is. You can understand it from a biblical context, both Old and New Testament. Talk about false teaching. But at this point, John is not getting into those details. He's just simply saying, you are safer if you're aware that danger is present. I was a desert boy when I was in Hawaii. I have never, I, up to that point, I had never swum in anything bigger than a stock tank. And I'm looking at an ocean. I didn't know at that point in my life that rip currents were even a thing because I wasn't aware of that. In the desert, we had our own dangers. In Hawaii, they had completely different dangers. But friends stopped me and said, be aware, be cautious. Understand very similar in verse eight, what I'm calling slippery conditions. Watch yourselves so that you don't lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Be aware that there's the hazard in the environment around us. There's a hazard, and that hazard is everywhere we go. It's on the internet. It's on our channels that we watch. It's on our feeds. It's on, the, it's on television. It's in books. It's in newspapers. Be aware the strong currents exist, but be even more cautious that these slippery conditions are wanting us to get trapped into this moment and lose our footing, lose our ground. You learn the truth. You come to church. You're a part of a Bible study group. You're a part of your small group. You're part of the worship services to understand what the scripture teaches. So that if you get into a place or a conversation or a, so you're reading something online and you suddenly begin to think to yourself, look, I don't think this sounds right. I'm not sure this is the way I believe. I'm not sure this is the way I was taught the scripture then recognize at that point, you're in a slippery condition. You're in a dangerous, hazardous condition. And it's not going to be fun if you slip and if you fall. I mean, John's very serious at this point. No, you don't want you to lose what you, what's already been worked for. We want you to receive the full benefit, the full reward that comes when we meet Jesus face to face in heaven or when he returns. Simply be aware. It's, it's not fun to walk out onto thin ice thinking you may or may not fall. It actually makes no sense to me. I don't know how many of you have watched these fail videos. And I watch the guys walk out and, and they're on a frozen lake or a frozen pond someplace. And, and it seems that the whole challenge is to walk further and see if they stay on top of the ice. And inevitably, that's why they end up being viral videos they don't. They fall through into the ice water. I'm thinking, who and why would you do that? I mean, it simply makes common sense to me. If the ice has the potential to break, why do it? The adrenaline rush isn't worth it. Why do it? When it comes to our faith, it's, even, it's true to an even greater extrapolated degree. Why do it? If you sense that what you're hearing, what you're listening, what you're reading, what you're participating in doesn't seem right, then that's a good time to back off and stay away. Which brings me to the third warning sign. We have strong currents that come with heresy. There is a tendency to pull us away, pull us out. We have these slippery conditions that once we get onto them, we're extremely in an extreme hazard and we need to get away from that. And that's the third sign. Stay close. Look at verse nine. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching, but goes beyond it, does not have God. If you recognize, if your spirit has a check in it that says, this doesn't seem right, then why go any further? Why, why go any deeper? If it, if it is becoming unclear, if it is becoming claustrophobic, if it is becoming this overwhelming sense of danger and what you're listening to seems to be taking you away, don't go any further. Because John goes on in verse 9 and says, the one who remains in that teaching, referring to the teachings of Jesus, the teachings about Jesus, all the counsel of the word of God, if you do that, then you're born of the father and you have the father and you have the son. 
Stay close. You know Jesus. You don't need to stray beyond that. We, we understand these concepts when it comes to literal physical moments in our lives, but oftentimes we, we throw them aside, we jettison them when it comes to our faith. I walked over to preschool this morning. It's the favorite part of the buildings to me. It's the, it's, I, I started to say the favorite part of the congregation, but then that leaves you wondering where you are on the, on the spectrum. But I love our preschoolers. I love talking to them. I love, love being with them. Um, I was accused of, of this morning of, of having maybe some ego driven because I'm a bit of a rock, rock star in the children's area and in the, in the preschool area. Once, once they get out of preschool, they're smart enough to figure it out. And so it doesn't last very long. Um, there were no kids over there. There was only one. And he knows me. We talk all the time. But whatever, for some reason, he was in a shire mood this morning. And every time I said something to him, every time I asked him what he was eating or what he was going to make today in Bible study, he would, he would turn, he'd kind of smile, and he'd grab onto mom's leg because mom's one of the workers over there. He instinctively knew. In that case, there was no real threat. I don't, I don't think. I guess <laughs> you can make that decision for yourselves. But in the perception of something just maybe being a little more anxious than normal, he immediately hugged up close. And when we understand this, you know, you're watching a movie and it gets a little frightening. And so you reach over and hold your wife's hand because she's stronger than you are and braver than you are. We, we get it. That's all John's saying is look, if, if, the, if there's strong currents and we need to be aware, if the conditions are slippery and there is hazard and we might possibly fall and injure ourselves, then simply stay close. And in this case, stay close to Jesus. Learn and grow and mature, and, but never forget the intimacy of your relationship with Jesus. For the vast majority of us, the reason we accepted Christ is because we understood at some level that God loves us more than anybody else and that God would forgive us and make our lives right. Sometimes, though, when we think we're maturing, we become so academic or so studious about it that it becomes a system. We even call it that in a seminary. We teach systematic theology to young ministers, and there is an appropriate system and organization to it. But the system isn't what saved me. Jesus himself came to earth, experienced the cruelty of those who were opposed to him, experienced that execution on the cross so that I might have a relationship with him. And if things start to become unnerving, then there is nothing wrong with me going back to that beginning moment and realizing that moment when I said, Jesus, I love you. I am trusting you to forgive me of my sins and give me new life. Jesus, I believe in you. I want to live with you. However you phrased it in those beginning moments of our faith, there's nothing wrong with going back to that moment and saying, Jesus, right now, I need you. And the truth is, that applies to every area of our life. Not just the teaching and not just the heresy, but it applies to every moment. If you're at the doctor's office, Jesus, I need you. If you're working on your bills, Jesus, I need you. If things have gotten frosty in the house, Jesus, I need you. If, if things are in, in turmoil at work, and it doesn't even look like maybe it's going to be there next week. Jesus, I need you. Interestingly enough, John writes the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, in the first three chapters, he's talking about churches and relationship with Jesus. And the church is called out to remember its first love. If the conditions are strong and hazardous, if the conditions are slippery and dangerous, then remember your first love and stay close to Jesus. The last one is just practical and it makes sense. Stand clear. John says these things are happening all around us. We need to be cautious. We need to be aware. We need to stick close to Jesus and then stand clear from those who would want to propagate or convince us to leave Jesus' side. 
If anyone comes to you, he says in verse 10, and does not bring this teaching, again, referring to the teaching of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us, if they don't bring that teaching, then don't receive them into your home. He says, go one step further. Do not even greet them. And we're going to see next week, John's commending the church for being hospitable in all circumstances. But here's this like one exception in this loving and kind man's life. If it's false teaching, have nothing to do with it. Stand clear. Don't even greet him, he says in verse 11, because in doing so, you begin to validate what he's saying and begin to share in that person's evil works. Stand clear. This is my biggest caution. I don't have a problem with people studying cults. I I did it. I had to teach that in seminary. But the problem is don't study the false beliefs of somebody else more than you study the true authority and teaching of the Word of God. Stand clear. You don't need to experiment with your faith. You don't need to try something else out in some other environment, in some other place. Stay clear. Stay away from it. Back to the rattlesnakes in the beginning. I walk a wide circle around them. I know there are people that love to play with them. I know there are people that love to pick them up. And I know people who die from doing that, just like you do. Just stand clear. Not everything in life needs to be embraced. And when it comes to false teaching, when it comes to heresy, when it comes to anything that diminishes the reality of who Jesus is, and especially who Jesus is in my heart, stay away from it. And again, I'm not going to give you a laundry list. You're already thinking of things in your own life. If it doesn't help you stay close to Jesus, then just stand clear. Leave it alone. You're not going to miss it.